changes in this system respond are return. How does the sequence of events improve the situation? I asked. She shrugged. Your crew will see you giving orders. I'll have vanished. Don't you think that's better than having me standing there like a heartbeat looking over your shoulder to make sure you're doing it right? I had to admit she had a point there. I accepted her conditions, as I had no other easy options. Returning to the command deck alone, I gave the orders. The transmission began. It left me with a hollow, worried feeling in the pit of my stomach. If I'd had a leg to stand on, I'd have defied her no matter what the orders from Earth said. As defiance captain, I had the right to safeguard her crew and her hull. The trouble was, the local population had shown no sign of hostility as of yet. I was therefore honor-bound to follow Grantholm's orders. As soon as the situation changed, however, I vowed to realign the rules more to my liking. 9. No one questioned my orders to begin transmitting the diplomatic address. Using a dozen languages and a hundred binary protocols, the canned message spoke of universal peace and harmony. It requested a response from any and all listeners every minute or two, providing long pauses in between. During these intervals, Yamada waited tensely for any hint of a reply. Nothing came back to us, not even a blip. A full hour passed, after which Lady Granthorne returned to the deck in irritation. What's wrong? she demanded. That message was crafted to elicit a surefire response. It's been tested on dozens of cultures and political factions. It never fails. Yamada spoke first. Perhaps they're not human. Preposterous, the ambassador scoffed, advancing to lean on the railing and leer in frustration at the forward screens. We've never met an alien species capable of building something like that artificial structure— we found nothing but a few bugs and plants. Maybe everyone aboard is dead, Zai suggested. Grantholm turned toward her. She nodded thoughtfully. That stands to reason. She wheeled on me next. Sparhawk, your beta is a thinker. I see now why you've so wisely added her to your team. I'm glad you approve, I said dryly. She walked to the forward screen and examined the data carefully. I'm no expert, she admitted, but this system looks like a death trap to me. One unexpected flare-up from that star could have licked this station, just once, mind you, and turned it into a giant microwave oven. Such an explanation had already occurred to me. The thought was cringeworthy, but I couldn't deny the possibility. Well, then, I said, what should we do next? Diplomatically speaking, I mean. Well, keep broadcasting the message, she said looking at me thoughtfully. What do you think we should do tactically? We'll approach the station in a non-threatening fashion. We'll keep our gun ports closed and our engines at half power. Hopefully they'll respond before we reach them. If not, I suggest we investigate the station. Board a derelict structure? She asked, impressed. Perhaps the Grantholm blood is strong in your veins. We were explorers once, you know. In my memory of family lore... The Sparhawks had discovered just as many worlds as had the Granthomes back in the days of family-financed expeditions. I decided not to bring that up, however. We're in agreement, then, I said. Steady as she goes, Helm. Lady Grantholm retreated from the deck after exacting a promise from me that I'd contact her the moment the situation changed. Looks like you hammered out a working relationship with the old battle-axe, Rumbold said when she'd left. If you don't mind my saying so, sir. We understand one another, I agreed. Is there still nothing in the way of a response, Yamada? Nothing, sir, not even a... Hold on. I spun my chair to face her. She placed her hands on her headset and tilted to one side. Her expression was one of intense concentration. I could tell she was trying to pick up an auditory signal and trying to ignore competing sounds. Are they saying something? I asked after several long seconds. Yamada shook her head. I'm not sure. Zai, tap into Yamada's feed. In fact, pipe it to everyone, please. A moment later, I joined them, listening to the raw data stream. All I heard was a tinny knocking sound, as if a hammer was tapping on sheet metal. What's that? What kind of feed are we picking up? It's not a transmission, Yamada said. I'm pinging the surface of the structure with low-powered lasers. The surface appears to be vibrating rhythmically. Every few seconds, 
the entire structure shakes a little. I don't understand it. So these noises are an interpolation of what it sounds like on the orbiting station? Right. If you were standing inside the structure, you'd hear something like this, only much louder. Turning back to the forward screen, I magnified the image to its maximum. The shape was that of a spinning polyhedron. There were 240 facets to the structure, each of them a triangular plane. Viewed as a single entity, the station looked almost spherical. As we watched, it slowly twirled around. We watched for a full minute before something significant changed. Captain, rumbled, shouted. One of the facets. It's an opening. Something small is coming out of it. A whole bunch of somethings. From this distance, it was hard to be sure about what we were looking at, but it was undeniably true that there were small objects coming out of the station. A black triangular mouth had yawned open, and it was spitting out items with regularity. I listened to the rhythmic knocking sound again. The beat of the knocking sounds matched the appearance of small objects. They're launching something, I said. That much is clear. Missiles? Rumbled asked. No, Zai said with certainty. They're fighters. They're taking up positions off to one side of the station, massing up into a large formation. Fighters, I said, putting down my headset. Apparently our diplomatic message has failed to impress these people, whoever they are. I began to order a logical series of countersteps. Two minutes later, Lady Granthorne made another appearance. What's this? she demanded. Announcing war on our newly discovered neighbors, Sparhawk? We're taking defensive precautions. All defiance shields are up, and we're pumping defensive drones out of the aft tanks. Well, suck them back up into your hold, she ordered. I didn't authorize any such action. I glanced at her. Madam Ambassador, I said, I'm within my rights to defend this ship and her crew, not to mention you. You're provoking them, she hissed, strutting around the deck and gesturing in frustration. You've convinced them we've come to conquer them. You were convinced an hour ago the system was dead. I'm only reacting to their hostile move. She made a guttural sound of vexation. I'm going to have to take over this mission, Sparhawk. It pains me, but... It's too late for that, I said, brushing aside the computer scroll she thrust at me again. We're in a combat situation. I'm now in charge of all tactical decisions. What? I thought the situation was clear. I'm empowered to take command of this... Yes, under specific circumstances. I would think it would aid you to read the document again. Under these conditions, I'm in charge of the expedition. This will go into my report, Sparhawk. Everything will be recorded and revealed at your court-martial. Possibly your scenario will come to pass, if we should be so lucky as to survive that long. In the meantime, I suggest you return to your quarters and strap in. We're going to battle stations, and our maneuvers are soon going to become harsh. Apparently she had read the entirety of the orders we were both following. She made no further effort to press her claims over tactical authority. She stormed off the deck and vanished into the passages behind me. I was glad to see her go. She was a distraction I couldn't afford right now. The klaxons sounded to indicate we were switching into a combat configuration. All over the ship, crewmen rushed to their battle stations. Every spacer soon wore a pressure suit and helmet. Armored ports rolled open to expose missiles, cannons, and dozens of other engines of destruction. Defiance weapons were revealed like fangs in the mouth of a predator. Shields are fully active just in case, Zai said. Keep them at half power until a specific threat is revealed, I ordered. She made the adjustments without comment. In space, combat can be tricky. One major element was a balancing act of power expenditures. There were many ways a commander could lose a fight before it even began. One sure way to hamstring a starship was to panic and turn on every defensive system too early. Shields, drones, and the like tended to draw upon the same power sources that offensive weapons did. Turning them on too early was like firing your cannons before you were within effective range, a waste of energy that would cost you later. On the other hand, if we went into combat thinking we had the situation perfectly mapped out, we might lose due to overconfidence. I'd put the shields up at half power to provide partial protection in case we were hit by surprise. This was, after all, an unknown enemy. 
It was nice not to have my command staff second-guess my every decision. They were tense, but they displayed a certain confidence I felt gratified to see. I'd gained their trust. Now, however, was the time to prove them right. The fighters are breaking wide. The three groups now, one starboard, one port, and the third coming in low in an arc. Tapping at my display, I examined this last group. Mr. Doris, I said. It's my opinion that the third group intends to flank and possibly come at us from the rear when we engage the other two squadrons. Do you concur? The math supports your theory, sir. We can't let them hit us in the engines. But if we run with full shielding on every quadrant of the ship at once, we'll have nothing left for our main batteries. I nodded. We were rapidly reaching the point at which there would be no options. We'd have to fire on them. There was one more possible maneuver, a full retreat but I felt that would be a mistake. These people weren't talking. They were hostile, and if their first experience with a ship from Earth was an easy victory, they might be emboldened. Open a hailing channel, Yamada, in the clear. Open, sir. Are they listening? As far as I can tell, they are. They're not talking, just sucking in every word we transmit like sponges. Nodding, I considered my words. I took in a deep breath. To the indigenous people of this star system... We mean you no harm. However, you've seen fit to attack an Earth warship. We must defend ourselves. Pull your fighters back, or I will destroy your station. Everyone looked at me in surprise. I ignored the lot of them. Tactical. Lock in on the primary structure. Not the fighters, sir? Duras asked. I glanced at him. You heard me. Target the facet that opened and release those fighters. Our main batteries will be within range in a few moments, if my reading of the data is correct. That's right, sir, he said, all business again. Firing solution computed and locked in. We waited tensely for nearly a minute. The fighter groups were all curving now, approaching us from three sides. Every heavy gun we had was targeting the main structure. Sir, Duris asked. I didn't look at him. They'd called my bluff. I wish things had gone differently. Then I gave the orders I felt I must. Fire bank one. Destroy that launch bay. Try not to rupture the rest of the structure. Duris met my eyes. We're too far out for such precision. We don't know how thick their armor is, or whether or not they have shields. Destroy the launch bay. With deliberate actions, he turned back to his boards and initiated the firing sequence. Outside, on Defiance Hull... A blaze of energy flared into life. Millions of kilowatts were released. They leapt across space, and several long seconds later touched upon the twirling, jewel-like station ahead of us. 10. As it turned out, the station did have shields. We lit them up, made them glow orange, and then punctured them, all within the span of seven seconds. We watched as the triangular mouth that had spit out so many fighters in our direction melted. It sagged, buckled, and merged with the facets surrounding it. The entire region sank inward somewhat, and the station now looked as if it had been viciously kicked in the side. Cease fire, I said. We haven't confirmed the complete destruction of the target yet, sir, Duras said. No, but I think they got the message. On our long-range tactical displays, the fighters were now shifting course. They veered off in three separate directions. Rumbold spun around and grinned at me. That's Sparhawk-style diplomacy if I ever saw it, Captain, he laughed. But no one else joined in. That had never phased Rumbold before, and he went on laughing. Captain, Yamada said suddenly. Her tone was one of disbelief. I turned to look at her expectantly. They've opened a channel. They're talking, sir. I can't believe you did it. I nodded as if I'd expected nothing less. In truth, I'd taken a gamble and made it pay off. There was no need to point that out to the crew, however. What are they speaking? I asked. The Terran standard. They have a slight accent, but any of us should be able to understand them. Pipe it through, please. The speakers boomed with a loud, raspy voice. Vandals, marauders, fiends, we don't accept your authority here. There was no visual feed as yet. I signaled Yamada to allow me to respond. We are none of these things, I said. 
nor are we here to assert authority over you or your system. Please identify yourselves. We're the chosen, the remaining, the last of our kind. My brow furrowed in thought. Their self-description wasn't as helpful as I'd hoped, but I didn't want to upset them any further. Tell me, chosen ones, did your kind come from Earth? A vast time ago there is evidence that we did. None alive remember such a time. We've lived through countless taxers and pirates such as yourselves. We will endure. Yamada waved to me, and I muted our outgoing channel. What is it, Commander? I asked her. Analysis of the voice indicates it's being produced by a human throat. Maybe they've been cut off out here and abused for decades. Her suggestion seemed to match the circumstances, and it gave me a direction in which to proceed. What is this place? I asked. Who am I speaking with? This star system is known to us as G. We are also called the G. I myself have been appointed the Conatic. I'm not sure what a Conatic is, sir, I said. Can you describe your function? I guide, I temporize, I defend and punish. I am the Conatic. I see. You are the leader, then, of your people? That's a very simplistic description, but I will allow this conversation to proceed to other points for purposes of expediency. What is your position, creature? I'm Captain William Sparhawk of House Sparhawk. I command this battle cruiser, the Defiant. Aha! said the voice, suddenly. You command a ship of war? Your intentions are now clear. You talk to waste our time, all the while gliding closer to gut our beloved tranquility station. You'll not find the G who live here defenseless. I rolled my eyes. We're not here to destroy you. Getting closer would not aid us if that was our purpose. I would simply stand off beyond your range and pound your station to slag. Violent words, he said. Words of war mixed with words of peace, arrogance extreme and malice immeasurable. These colonists had a very odd way of expressing themselves. It was almost as if they were narrating their thoughts aloud. I was trying to get used to it, but it wasn't easy. Listen, Kinetic, if we wanted to destroy you, we would be doing it, not talking. I'm here to communicate with you and other splintered colonies like yours. Earth is back. We're rebuilding our network to our orphaned colonies. We intend to engage in trade and peaceful coexistence with anyone who will allow it. There was a moment of silence, and when the Kinetic came back on the line, his voice had changed. It now held a calculating note. I see. Rebuilding the Empire set asunder so long ago. All becomes clear. It's like a slice of sky free of gases and dust. You're here to ask us to yoke ourselves like idiot oxen. Unable to help myself, I sighed loudly. I suggest we stand down our weapons. We will close our gun ports if you close yours. Withdraw your fighters, and we'll park ourselves in orbit around your station. Then I'll come aboard with a few of my officers to meet you in person. Invasion? demanded the voice incredulously. Does it think we'd be so foolish as to allow ourselves to be boarded without firing a shot? The conversation went on in this vein for the next twenty minutes. In time, I managed to hammer out a plan of behaviors. They were paranoid in the extreme, and would only agree to single steps at a time. The first thing both sides did was sheathe our bared weapons. Our gun ports, missile batteries, and pellet blasters were all closed and shunted into the guts of our respective vessels. By the time we slowed and began to circle the station, the Kinetic was in a more forgiving mood. Perhaps he was starting to trust me, just a little. A full hour after the conversation began, I found myself marching down the central passage to my quarters. There I donned a dress uniform, my smart pistol, and power saber. I tested the clasp at my neck and momentarily my cloak blossomed into a personal shield. A hundred strides later I found myself on the pinnace deck. Defiant's original design didn't have such a deck, but we'd altered one of the holds to allow small spacecraft to enter and exit. The ship now functioned more like a traditional Earth warship. There at the pinnace door I met up with an unpleasant surprise. I could see through the hatchway, and there was no mistaking the distinctive form of Ambassador Granthorne. 
Are you flying this thing yourself, William? she asked. No, madam. Zai here will serve as my pilot. Zai pressed past me and took her seat. She studiously ignored both of us. I was sure she was aware of our ongoing strife, but it didn't seem to interest her much. Well, Granthorm called. Climb aboard, Sparhawk. We don't have much time to waste. I let you prattle on and on with that canatic fellow for nearly an hour. Imagine my trepidation and horror at every word. You almost started a war on three separate occasions. Are you aware of that? Madam, I said sternly, the situation is volatile and may turn hostile again at any moment. No treaty exists between these people and Earth. They might intend to skewer us all the moment we arrive. Accordingly, I must ask that you stay here aboard Defiant until I declare the situation safe for civilians. She cocked her head quizzically to one side and regarded me with narrowed eyes. You'll not weasel out that way. The situation has progressed. You did an excellent job of gaining their trust after terrifying them. Honestly, I didn't think you had it in you to intimidate a lesser power like that. I stand happily corrected. Madam, I can't allow you to endanger yourself, I began again. But she lifted her hand to stop me. Just give it up, Sparhawk. I know you too well. You're a man of truth and honor. Most importantly, you follow orders. She snapped out the computer scroll again. This made me wince. She had a strong point. You've read this document, she said. You know the truth. There's no room for odd interpretations, especially not for a rule stickler like you. Now that hostilities have ceased, you must bend to my authority again. I'll be leading this diplomatic mission, as I'm the diplomat. We stared at one another, and both of us knew the truth of it. She had me. Nodding my head, I reached up and grasped the hatch by the ring that served as a door handle. Very well, Ambassador Grantham. I will await your return. So saying, I slammed the hatch closed. 11. I managed to take a dozen angry steps across the hangar deck before the pinnace hatch creaked open behind me again. Sparhawk, Grantham called, I haven't dismissed you. Please return and attend me immediately. Halting in irritation, it took an effort of will to turn around and face her without shouting profanity. It was one thing, after all, to accept her authority as a non-military official over what was essentially a military mission. To have her ordering me around like a cabin boy was something quite different. All that aside, however, she did have the authority to command any diplomatic effort, which was what we were clearly embarked upon now. Reluctantly, I returned to the pinnace and gave her a wry grimace. You can't abandon your role in this effort now, she said. Is this a fit of pique? If so, it's quite unprofessional. Madam Ambassador, I'm returning to the command deck. Someone must prepare for any upcoming battle your visit may instigate. She made a snorting sound. Now who's insulting whom? Look, William, let's cooperate. The people on this station spoke to you before, and you promised you would meet them in person— why you did so is still beyond me, but that's done now. The point is they expect Captain Sparhawk to step onto their station. I will command the away team, I said. You must listen to me if things go badly. You can talk to their leaders after I introduce you, agreed? She laughed. The away team? You mean yourself and this giantess? Fine. If things go badly, I would assume we'll all be swiftly killed anyway. With ill grace, I boarded the pinnace and moved forward to sit beside Zai. The hangar was depressurized, and a blast shield rolled away to reveal a black rectangle of open space. Off to the lower left, the station was visible. Zai lofted the pinnace, and we glided out into the void. The view was magnificent. Up close, the station resembled a multifaceted silver ornament— as it spun, the fire of the orange star nearby lit up the facets and sent brilliant flashes of color in every direction. There! See the damage you did? Lady Grantham exclaimed, pointing at a blackened facet that looked like a burnt-out triangular hole in the hull. I do indeed, I said. Recall that if I hadn't punctured their pretty station, they'd have attacked us with their fighters. Her face twisted up in irritation. Your crewmen are constantly telling me how smart you are. Perhaps in this case you are in the right, 
But you shouldn't let things like this go to your head, William. Speaking of the fighters, where are they now? Following us, cautiously. They have yet to return to the station. Perhaps they can't because you destroyed their launch deck. I shrugged. It's possible. We said little else as we followed a landing signal toward the station. A section of the shield flickered out, and we entered the inner zone near the hull. At the last moment, when we were barely crawling, our guests finally saw fit to open another facet. The opening beyond it was pitch black. Zai eased the craft into this massive region. Up close, the station was more impressive than I'd realized. Earth had never built anything so large. The station had to be the size of a small moon, at least five kilometers in diameter. It felt as if we were being swallowed as we entered the station. The door slid shut behind us, and the chamber beyond lit up. I'd been expecting to see a cargo hold. Instead, we landed on a large deck in the midst of a dozen spacecraft. They were shuttles, repair ships, and several tugs. I assumed it was a small support fleet. These ships are damaged, Zai noted. It was the first time she'd spoken since we'd launched. How's that possible? Granthom demanded. Sparhawk hasn't taken a shot at them yet. You're right, I said to Zai, ignoring the ambassador. They're all damaged. That indicates this station has recently been in combat. But with whom? Maybe they're paranoid for a reason, Zai suggested. Together we left the ship and stood waiting near its landing gear. A group of armored troops approached with rifles in their hands. We made no hostile moves. Captain Sparhawk, inquired the lieutenant in charge. I'm Captain Sparhawk. Accompany me, sir. We followed the guards, who closed ranks around us. They took our sidearms, but left me my sword, assuming it was ceremonial in function. Zai eyed them with distrust but she gave up her pistol sullenly. The troops around us kept casting sidelong glances at her. They clearly found her worrisome. The colonists weren't very tall people. They were all shorter than Zai and myself. Maybe they found our size intimidating. It was difficult to say. We were ushered into a chamber deep within the station. The more levels we traversed inward, the more people seemed to join the party. I was impressed by their numbers and by the apparent level of interest they had in us. At last we were marched into a sweeping chamber of unsurpassed beauty. The walls, they didn't look like walls. They were holographic projections, they had to be. An apparent landscape of lush beauty and sunlight rolled in a curving arc for kilometers around. From our point of view, it looked like we were at the bottom of a bowl, with fields, trees, and even gently rolling hills crawling upward in every direction around us. The guards smiled at our reactions. Even Zai seemed taken aback. A false interior? Zai asked. An encapsulated atmosphere of such volume? This is an engineering marvel. Don't be daft, girl, Lady Grantholm said. It's nothing but an illusion. Those walls are screens. They're probably less than a hundred meters off. Frowning, I stopped to pluck a sunflower from a path strewn with white pebbles. I tilted my head up until I looked directly overhead. There, above us all, sat a bulbous contraption, much of which was shrouded in steam. It seemed to emit brilliant light from some angles, and, was it possible? Silvery rain fell. Droplets were falling from it, sheeting down toward us. As I watched, the rain came to sweep over us and sprinkle us with light droplets. I turned to the captain of the guard and chanted, I can't believe it, I told him. This is marvelous. That's the core up there, isn't it? The core of the entire station? It's raining on us, and other spots are shining bright light, as if you captured your own personal sun. Yes, exactly, he said. I couldn't help but note the pride in his voice. This is real, demanded Lady Grantholm suddenly. What a gross display of wealth. I like it. Powered by the sun outside, shining upon those countless solar collectors. Yes, and don't think that I've missed the brilliance of this move diplomatically. How better to begin a negotiation than to impress your opponents so utterly? The guardsman looked bemused. Truly marvelous, I said. Is that what you've brought us here to see? To show us your engineering capabilities? No, not exactly, the captain admitted. But we are thoughtful people. 
Determined, yes, harsh, some would say, but we firmly believe the final moments of any being should be spent peacefully. Frowning in concern, I took stock of the situation. We'd stopped marching. We were, indeed, at the end of the path of white pebbles we'd been following. A set of dark holes, freshly dug, could be seen here and there among the waving sunflowers. Turning back toward the guardsmen, I nodded in understanding. My hand went to the clasp around my neck, which I touched with seemingly idle fingers. I get it, I said. You mean to bury us here, don't you? Yes, said the captain, brightening. I hope you appreciate the gesture. Granthome froze. Her face displayed shock. Zai stood with her eyes cast low. I knew she was watching them all at once with her peripheral vision. Her bunched shoulders let me know she was ready for anything, despite her quiet demeanor. My eyes returned to the captain. What gesture? This is my personal plot. I volunteered this land for special service. Others had refused. Ah, I said. Your generosity is to be commended. Lady Granthorne's eyes slid to me. She clearly thought I was as insane as this farmer who so calmly discussed our murders. That can't be the entire story, I said. Surely there's something in this for you. The captain shrugged. Well, I grow these sunflowers. I love the flavor of the seeds when they're soaked in brine. You'll feed them well, in my opinion. Also, I believe I can turn a better profit at the local market with the next crop by advertising they were fed by outsider fluids, even if they taste exactly the same. How enterprising, I said in a tone I hoped was perfectly calm. Taking two strides toward the fields, I saw the squad around us become alert. They lifted their lance-like weapons. The tips were energy projectors. I wasn't sure yet whether they possessed range or if they had to be applied directly to the body to kill. I figured I would most likely be enlightened on this point very soon. May I? I asked the captain, reaching for a large bloom. Ah, of course, he said, stepping toward me and touching the plant I'd indicated. They said you would be uncivilized, but clearly you're a man of rare spirit. As his hands left his weapon and touched the plant in question, I made my move. Twelve. My sword is anything but ceremonial. To explain that reality requires some understanding of Earth's past. Dueling had been legalized on Earth nearly a century ago, during the period of relative lawlessness that followed the cataclysm. Over time, dueling had come to be seen as a rational way to allow individuals to sort out disagreements among themselves. By the time the guard had restored order to the planet, the habit had become ingrained in the culture. Historians postulated that this change was nothing unusual. Throughout human history, the settlement of bitter disagreements had often been done through dueling. Ceremonial combat governed by rules of honor had provided countless societies a quick, cheap, and final solution to arguments. They were actually quite effective when compared to, say, a civil lawsuit. As a member of a great house, I'd therefore been trained to handle a power sword at a very young age. That process took decades, and it started with the use of my sword as utensil. As the duelists of centuries past had done, I'd been raised with my blade in my hand. I'd learned to use it as a pointing device, a tool, and even for eating at times. It had become an extension of my arm and I felt more comfortable whenever it was within reach. The guard captain believed his power lance and the squad of troops backing him up meant we'd be easy to defeat, but he was taken by surprise. As a rule, I don't like deception. I refuse to practice it upon unsuspecting innocence. This man, however, had led us here under a false pretext. He was anything but honorable, farmer or not. My rapier was in my hand after a brief rasping of steel and leather. In a single motion, I drew it and drove it between two ribs. He fell to his knees, his heart pierced. His hand went to the blade, but I drew it out quickly. The captain's severed thumb dropped to the turf a moment before the rest of him sagged beside it. My other hand was at the clasp of my cloak, which served as a button to activate the garment. Some would say the cloak was an expensive rich man's toy, but I found it had served me well in any number of unexpected situations. The cloak lit up, 
extending a personal shield around my person. To an outside observer, a series of angular planes of force surrounded my body. I resembled someone locked in clear ice. The effect moved with me, however, following my actions perfectly. Surprised, the squad of soldiers only hesitated for a few seconds before they rushed me with their lance tips glowing. As yet, none of them had been fired in my direction. I surmised immediately that the weapons killed by touch. In their haste, the soldiers made a grave error. While rushing me, they turned their backs upon Zai and Lady Grantholm. My aunt was elderly, but she was a mean old bird. I could have told them as much. She drew a hidden dagger and stabbed with it at the nearest man. He grabbed her wrist contemptuously, but then she caressed his arm with the blade. This caused a spark of power to erupt. The man slumped, his body racked in spasms. Zai was less subtle. She grabbed the heads of two of the smaller men, one skull cupped by each of her massive hands. Slamming them together, she sent up a spray of blood. The muffled crunch was awful to hear. The last two men charged me and thrust. Their lances touched my shielding, and a shower of sparks resulted. Finding my defenses impenetrable, they quickly backed away with their weapons held up in a defensive posture. They were breathing hard, and their eyes were wide. Crushed sunflowers rustled under their boots as they backpedaled away from us. The crowd of civilians that had quietly followed us to this spot, undoubtedly planning to enjoy our execution and burial, now melted away from the scene with shrieks and pounding feet. "'Don't let them live!' Granthorn shouted. "'They'll bring a thousand more down on us!' I glanced at her. "'I'm in charge of this team's defense, remember?' She bared her teeth and held her dagger like a trained fighter, which she was. Turning back to the retreating soldiers, I lifted the man whom my aunt had shocked into submission. He was groggy, but he slowly regained the use of his limbs as I talked to him. We must talk with your leader, I said. Where is the Kanatic? I demand to meet him. This seemed to get through to him. You demand to see the Kanatic? I do. Summon him or take me to him now. If you don't, I'll kill you where you stand. The guardsmen, who'd been retreating, had halted at a safe distance to watch and listen. They shifted uneasily on their feet, and I could tell they were considering another run for it. I've easily slain half your squad without a scratch, I pointed out. If you don't obey, my ship will soon kill you all. What do you mean? One of the wary guardsmen asked. Do you really think a marauding ship from Earth would allow you to kill her captain? They'll melt this shiny station down to a puddle of liquid steel. They looked uncertain and fearful. I had to wonder, in that part of my mind that was still capable of reflecting on things coldly, how had these people degenerated to such a state? They appeared technological and capable but there was an undeniable impression of the rube about them. They'd regressed in their knowledge of the behavior of others. Perhaps they'd even sunken into barbarism. I hoped the cosmos wasn't full of isolated colonists like these people. One of the survivors finally swallowed. I'll contact the kinetic. We must have guidance. Please hurry, I said. My ship is expecting me to communicate soon. As per their orders, they'll proceed with the destruction of the station within the hour. He nodded, licking his lips. I'd bluffed him, but there had been some truth to my words. Left out of contact with me for long enough, First Officer Duris would assume command. He'd definitely consider damaging this structure. There would certainly be a great loss of life, whoever won the conflict. The three of us were soon left to our own devices. Lady Grantholm turned to me and treated me to a very unfriendly expression. I've lived for over a century, she said, and to think, after all that time, I'm going to end my days the victim of barbarians in this alien place. It's not fitting at all. You choose your path. We came as explorers. History is littered with any number of dead explorers. You're too clever for your own good, Sparhawk. You're arrogant, overconfident. Just because you've won so often is no guarantee you'll win here today. These people have only to call for reinforcements. They'll pincushion us with arrows or encircle us with their powered lances and jab until we're dead. I shrugged. It may turn out the way you suggest. Why, then, are we here? She demanded, her voice cracking in exasperation. We're on a diplomatic mission. 
I said. What would you have said if I'd destroyed the station and all its inhabitants when they attacked instead of trying to come to terms? I'd have called you a genocidal maniac, she admitted. But you would have made the right decision if you'd struck. Now we're the weak ones in their power. I disagree. We're engaged in diplomacy of a sort. If we hope to make friends with savages, a certain degree of risk is to be expected. She sniffed. This world isn't at all what I expected. None of this is. My skills at negotiating have been negated by a pack of fools with lances. What did they think we would do? Climb into these graves and pull clods down over ourselves? The field moved in a soft wind. Somewhere a chime tinkled. It was odd standing among dead men in such a peaceful environment. Yes, it was artificial, but it didn't feel that way. Instead, it felt as if we were standing on a lovely alien world surrounded by lush growths. Perfectly simulated sunlight, rain, and fertile soil, Zai said. For all their faults, these people are industrious and artistic. They possess an appreciation for beauty and engineering, I agreed. Too bad they've fallen into a state of fear, continued Zai. I turned to her thoughtfully. Is that what you think? You might be right. Since we got here, they've been acting like we've come to abuse them. That would indicate they've been abused by others. We must try to get to the bottom of their story in order to more fully understand them. These people have clearly suffered much, she said. They're so fearful they're dangerous, but they make terrible warriors. In the midst of our discussion, a figure appeared. The figure was slight and feminine. No one else accompanied her. Who are you? I asked. I am the Kinetic, she said. I watch all, and all watch me. You have done much damage here. Frowning, I looked around at the land. I sensed immediately how the scene must appear. We stood in a field of lovely trampled flowers with three dead men at our feet. Perhaps we can help, I said. We can bury your dead. They will feed the flowers with their fluids. The Kinetic brightened. Yes, she said. That would be best. Zai and Lady Grantholm exchanged baffled glances, and they both shrugged. While Grantholm stood well clear, Zai and I bent to the task. We dragged the bodies into the graves and placed them there as gently as we were able. Careful, the woman said, coming close and standing near to watch. Make sure you bury them with their eyes open and their faces turned up to the sun. That is our way. Zai glanced overhead, squinting at the brilliant glare in the center of the hollow station. I could tell she thought the Kinetic might be mad, but she didn't let on. After we'd buried them, I spoke to the Kinetic gently. You are the leader here? I'm the Kinetic. I heard your voice during our conversations. I thought it was male. She shook her head. We alter our transmissions to make ourselves sound more threatening. In this case, it appears that we failed. I looked at her in concern. Tell me, why do you fear us so? Since we've arrived, you've hidden, lied, and attempted to trick us. She looked at me thoughtfully. I came here to offer my life in return for the lives of my people. Will you not accept this exchange? What? I don't understand. You threatened to destroy our station. Was that report inaccurate? For some reason, I felt a pang at her words. She was a young woman, perhaps thirty years of age. She was pleasant to listen to and to look upon. She made me feel as if I were the barbarian, a monster bent upon disturbing the peace of her world. In a way, I knew she was right if she held that opinion. Thus far, not a single member of my crew had died. In contrast, these people had suffered a number of losses and significant damage to their station. I must talk to my crew. They must know that I'm in good health. And if you don't... They'll kill two million peaceful souls, isn't that right? Well, I began uncertainly. Look, your soldiers said they would take us to meet you. Then when we arrived, they took us instead to this field and told us we were to be executed. At that point, you started the violence. Ah, she said, shaking her head. She walked forward and knelt by the grave of the squad's captain. Foolish Trent. That must have been his idea. It's too bad he failed so miserably. He was never a killer at heart, but he thought he should be. So, I began, 
These men didn't attempt to execute us because they were following your orders? No. Trent took matters into his own hands. He's always felt protective of me. I'm sure he believed you would kill or abduct me if he led you into my presence. Things were beginning to make sense at last. This woman, the Canatic, wasn't our arch-nemesis. She was a calm leader, a queen of sorts. Her guardsmen had decided to protect her unilaterally. Well, then, boomed Lady Grantholm. She swept past me and interceded her body between myself and the Canatic. I take great pleasure in making your acquaintance, Conatic. I'm an ambassador from Earth. We're here to open diplomatic negotiations. The Conatic seemed bemused, but she allowed the older woman to take her arm and begin a very long speech about Earth's benevolence, our plentiful trade goods, and our intentions of mutual defense. I found myself, somewhat reluctantly, left behind in their wake with Zai as the two women walked toward a small village in the distance. Zai observed me for a time and spoke at length. Why do you prefer the smallest of females? she asked. Uh, she's nice enough, I guess. That wasn't my question. Zai, we've been over this before, and you've never given me a satisfactory response. I looked at her. We're not supposed to date, you and I. Guardsmen are forbidden to fraternize when one is in command of the other. She tilted her head in a gesture of puzzlement. Are you asking me to resign my commission so our relationship might advance? I heaved a sigh. No, Zai, that isn't what I'm saying at all. Thirteen. Over the next few hours, many of our questions were answered. We were also allowed to communicate with Defiant. This contact was met with obvious relief by Duris. And things are going well, Captain? He asked for a second time. I ran my eyes over Grantholm and Zai. They both looked uncertain. Yes, I said at last. We've met the Kinetic. After a few misunderstandings, these people have turned out to be quite polite. All right, sir. I'll expect to hear from you again in one hour. You will. Disconnecting, I managed to sum up a smile for the Kinetic. She watched me warily. I had to give her credit. She was a brave one. She'd come alone and unarmed to speak with people who'd slaughtered a squad of her guards. We'd been provoked, yes, but she couldn't know if we were savages or not. Noticing she was staring at me without speaking, I gave the Canatic a smile in return. Lady Granthorne cleared her throat. Originally, your people came from Japan sector, if I understand it, she said to the Canatic. Is that correct? Yes, I believe that was the name of the place. I take it you don't speak the old language? Very few have any memory of it. We've taught our young only standard for a century now. You know, Grantholm said, walking about the garden we found ourselves in, this place is artfully done. Would it surprise you to know that there are places very much like this back on Earth in Japan sector? I suppose it would only be logical, the Canatic said politely. She'd turned away from Grantholm and had planted her eyes back upon me again. I found her frank scrutiny a little disturbing. So did Zai, I could tell. Zai wasn't saying anything. She wasn't even frowning. But her unblinking gaze and slightly hunched shoulders told the tale to anyone who knew her well. Lady, Grantholm said, stepping closer to the Canatic and trying to wrest her attention from me. What is it? We must discuss agreements— Earth has much to offer and would like to trade with you. As you wish. But we have little of value. Bandits regularly take it all. Grantholm faltered, then continued. Bandits? They come here often? Yes, they demand tribute, slaves, resources. We fight them if we can. Grantholm's tongue appeared and vanished again. I see. Perhaps you need arms, then. That's a trade good you could use. For the first time, the Canatic turned to her and gave the ambassador her full attention. Earth would do what? Give arms for sunflowers, slaves, and raw radioactive ore? I myself was taken aback. I didn't know what my aunt had been empowered to offer. Earth must want a trading partner pretty badly to hand out weapons in return for useless items. No slaves, please, Grantholm said. 
but we'll take a few of your agricultural goods if they're of quality. In return, we'll give you orbital platforms, missiles, and detection systems. The Kinetic frowned. We don't need more Earth troops or warships here. You fight well, but we must maintain our sovereignty. Of course, of course, Grantholm purred. Are you interested? I'd be a fool to pass up such an offer. It's so generous, however, I'm suspicious of your motives. Grantholm nodded. Let me enlighten you, then. We need knowledge, Kinetic. Earth is strong, but we've been cut off from our child colonies for so long we don't know them any longer. We need to know who is dangerous, who can be trusted, and how to find them. Ah, the Kinetic said in sudden understanding. You need our maps, our knowledge of the bridges and the systems beyond each of them. That's right. The Kinetic appeared to consider the matter carefully. We agree, she said suddenly, after approximately a minute's deliberation. Just like that? I asked. You have that power? There's no council, no meetings of wise people to ponder the details? She looked at me as if I was unbalanced. I am the Kinetic, she said simply. Her tone suggested this explained everything. All right, then, Lady Grantholm said, clapping her hands together and giving the Kinetic a beaming smile. She gave me a dour look that clearly suggested I should shut up. I hope you'll all meet me for a ceremonial dinner, the Kinetic said. We certainly will, Grantholm assured her. The leader of this strange colony then left us, and Lady Grantholm turned on me. William, she said, please don't question the sanity of our hosts if they immediately agree to our terms. Sorry about that. She surprised me. She surprised me as well, Grantholm said, beginning to pace. This deal is critical to Earth. I suggest you bed her tonight, after this dinner event of theirs. Don't be shy, be direct. It was my turn to appear shocked. Zai was equally alarmed. What? I demanded. Why would I? Don't be naive, boy. She fancies you, that's obvious. In primitive cultures, dashing men in ships have always held a lure for a princess stuck on an island somewhere. I didn't know what to say. Madam, I have commitments back home. What? Are you refusing to do your duty out of loyalty to House Astra? Are you a sparhawk or not? I'm not sure what you mean, lady, but I'm indeed a sparhawk. Our house, your house, is one of expediency. Your father would bet a crone to broker a deal, and your mother wouldn't do more than grit her teeth over it. This statement bothered me, and it fascinated Zai. But I didn't protest. I couldn't. My aunt was right, and we both knew it. My parents were political animals. They'd long ago abandoned certain niceties in their quest for influence. Be ready in an hour, the ambassador said. We'll eat with them and seal this deal. Once we have their star charts, we'll leave this abominable system. There has to be a better trading partner than this hellhole out here in space somewhere. So saying, my aunt left the room. I could feel Zai's stare upon me. I didn't face her. Are you going to do it? She asked me quietly. I don't know, I said. It's such a big opportunity for Earth— if we can get a list of ER bridges and the world's connected, imagine the number of missteps that could be avoided. The risks would be drastically reduced. Our entire mission would benefit quite significantly as well. You like her, don't you? The Kinetic. I didn't respond. I did like her. There was something exotic, intelligent, and innocent about her all at the same time. The truth was I'd had as much trouble keeping my eyes off her as she'd had with me. I don't see why she's so appealing. Zai, don't be jealous. Why not? It's not constructive. It's not professional. Besides, there's no cause for it. You and I have never been involved. She stepped in front of me, and I looked at her big face. You saved me. Another would have slain me or left me there to rot. You released me from my prison of years. I'd given up hope, you know. I nodded. I'd suspected as much. When I'd first met Zai, she'd been a forgotten prisoner, abandoned on defiant by her own people. Only the fact that the cell had been automated to care for her had allowed her to live so long. Putting out my hands, I took hers. You're a dear and loyal friend. Can that endure? 
Can you overcome your feelings and stay at my side? Yes, she said, after a thoughtful pause. But if you mate with this colonist, I'll dream of strangling her. I chuckled. I understand. You probably wouldn't be the only one. We parted to clean ourselves in hot baths of still water in preparation for our political meal. I found myself thinking about Lady Astra, the woman who'd captured my heart nearly two years ago. We were lovers, but we weren't betrothed. We'd never made each other promise to be faithful during my long journeys. We were both realists, and now that relationship was at an end. It was difficult for people of high station to remain monogamous, especially when one of them was obliged to travel the stars for weeks, months, or even years at a time. Lady Astra had moved on. I wondered if I should do the same. What should I do if the Canadic made her intentions even more clear? What would I do? I wasn't sure. Arriving at a set of ornamental gates, I offered my arm to Lady Granthorn. She took it, and we walked in together. Automatically, we moved with lock-stepped grace. We'd been to countless pageant-like gatherings of our own, and we felt at home among the silk-clad people who surrounded us. Zai, on the other hand, looked very annoyed. She was a brooding figure. She hulked in one corner, eating and staring rudely at the colonists. The natives dodged out of her way whenever she approached the central buffet to fill her plate again, and she offered no apology for scaring them. She ate a lot, but I pretended not to notice. The food itself was excellent. There were many dishes of an earthly nature, such as kiwi-like fruits, chilled slices of spiced fish and rice with a peculiarly long grain. But there had been several dishes I couldn't readily identify, such as a dark meat that tasted something like a cooked beet. The Canadic finally made her appearance after everyone had eaten and engaged afterward in polite conversation for nearly an hour, awaiting her arrival. Apparently, coming to the party late was normal for the Canadic. Her glorious entrance stopped my conversation at once. I could no longer recall what I'd been talking about. She wasn't as she'd appeared before. Instead of simple utilitarian clothing, she dressed in a blooming gown of white. The gown itself wasn't a flat fabric, but rather was made up of countless triangular wedges of cloth sewn together. I realized instantly that she was wearing a costume that resembled the station we were dining within. It was an odd effect, almost something a primitive people of earth might have done. Whatever the intention and the origin of her clothing, the effect was stunning, and her face was lovely. I stood up when the rest of the people did, and I felt myself entranced. She made no lengthy speeches. She nodded to those who came close to greet her, and she eventually made her way to Lady Grantham and I. My aunt gave me an unsubtle nudge. I stepped forward and bowed low, sweeping my right hand almost to the floor as I'd seen the others do. My lady, I said, you look lovely tonight. Those around us were within earshot, fell silent, and froze. Instantly I realized I'd committed an error, a breach of etiquette. Rather than apologize, I smiled broadly. Surely these people must realize I didn't know their customs. I'm sorry if my nephew offends, Lady Grantholm said quickly. He's never been an easy one to train. The Canadic slid her eyes to my aunt, then back to me where they locked in place. It is nothing, she said. All around us the others started breathing again. I did the same. I'd held my fixed smile throughout the moment, and I didn't let it slip now. Would you be so kind as to join us? I asked. I will, she said. Together we circled around a low table with soft edges and firm pillows for seats. Zai watched this from perhaps ten meters away. She was alone, and she was consuming yet another plate of food. The Canadic's dress didn't puff up and block her vision as I'd thought it might. It had been cunningly designed to fold as she sat down, allowing her to appear at ease. She nibbled a few choice items, then turned her gaze back up to us. I didn't realize you were related. Oh, Lady Grantholm said. Yes, we are. William's grandmother is my niece. I see, she said. Such a relationship indicates either great age on your part or great youth on William's. Which is it? It was our turn to be mildly offended, with the advent of longevity drugs, people's physical ages on Earth had been less easy to identify. 
It had over time become rude to bring up disparities such as the one she'd pointed out. But as guests, we tried to hide our displeasure. Lady Grantholm leaned forward and whispered her answer, as if it was a distasteful topic. You have to understand, my dear, that on earth people live very long, full lives. The Canadic stared at her for a moment. Just how old are you, Ambassador? My aunt licked her lips. Her eyes flashed, but she managed to hold on to her smile. I'm a hundred and seventy years young. The Canadic made a tiny coughing sound. Her eyes widened to an almost comical degree. Really? How is this possible? I jumped in then, explaining that we'd developed Rejuve on Earth, and later on even more powerful longevity drugs. She listened closely. So, she purred, how old are you, William? I'm still under thirty, I said, smiling. It was barely true, but I knew the answer was the right one, because she seemed relieved. Good. Our conversation became lighter after that. The Canadic explained the origins of every dish at the feast. Some were alarming, such as the skull-sized spiders they'd learned to grow in their air shafts, to others which seemed perfectly normal to us. By the end of the discussion on foodstuffs, I'd learned the station had regular trading partners as well as raiders. Since they'd never seen our ship before, they'd assumed we were the latter when we'd arrived. After dinner was whisked away by a large group of servants that came in a rush and left in a flurry, we moved on to a new stage that involved drinking. This was an unexpected development. I'd never seen anyone on the station drink, smoke, or otherwise engage in adult entertainment. The clear liquid the Canadic poured into a tiny cup for me was quite potent. It tasted like pure ethanol, and I almost sneezed when I sniffed it. Very quickly the nature of the party shifted as we all sipped and relaxed. People became louder and less reserved. I chanced to look in Zai's direction. She was still lurking in the corner. Alone and watching us, she refused the drink despite the attempts of multiple pourers. Lady Grantholm soon noticed her as well. She leaned close to me and hissed in my ear so that no one else could hear. You have to get control of your bodyguard. She's being extremely rude. Can't you send her back to the ship or something? I think you misunderstand the nature of our relationship, I told my aunt. She gave me a frown. What? Are you bedding that big woman as well? That's not what I meant, I said in irritation. The Canadic giggled suddenly. We looked back up at her. You two are different, she said. When we drink, we smile. I forced a smile. I, too, was being affected by the drink, but I had implants that were capable of chemically neutralizing the intoxicating effects if I wanted them to. That was a secret we'd yet to share with the G. It was good, I thought, to have such a strategic advantage over your negotiating partners. I'm sorry, I said. We're large and accustomed to strong drink. I'll have another glass to improve my mood. She poured again, and I choked it down. After that, I endeavored to appear at least slightly intoxicated. We must dance, the Canadic announced suddenly. She stood up, swaying very slightly. I stood up with her. I'd been formally trained in a dozen types of dance, but as the music began and I joined her, I found it difficult to match her intricate steps. The situation wasn't helped by the fact I towered over her. Still, she was impressed. You can do it, she said. Many G take years to perfect even the basic steps. I've danced before, I said modestly. She hugged up against me then and I saw at least a dozen sets of eyes take notice. There were bodyguards in her party, as well as Zai on my side. It was a thing I'd become accustomed to in my life. You must show me a dance from your world. I began a slow waltz. She picked it up easily, despite her drunkenness. I found her touch and close movements as intoxicating as the strong drink had been. At last the music faded. Most of the party-goers began to exit the building. With a flourish, I brushed the back of her tiny hand with my lips. She seemed fascinated with the gesture. It looks like the evening is at an end, my lady, I said. I must take my leave. She hesitated, then stepped close. I dipped my head to her tiny mouth, and she whispered hotly in my ear, Won't you stay with me? 
For the night, please? I froze. Here it was, the moment of decision. Fourteen. A frozen second followed her proposal. During this short time, my mind traveled a dozen paths with lightning speed. What does one do when asked to bed a princess? During the evening of feasting and talking, I'd come to learn she fit the description of any princess throughout history. A hundred and fifty-odd years ago, a colony ship known as the Constellation had left Earth. The vessel had been of an advanced design for the times. The people aboard weren't poor refugees or outcasts. They were explorers determined to stake a claim among the stars and get rich by exploiting a system no one else could legitimately say was their own. The Canadic had been born the great-granddaughter of Constellation's original captain. As the colony had fallen on hard times almost immediately after leaving the solar system, they'd never advanced to civilian control as most colonies did. The crew had remained in charge of the mission for a century and a half. Over time, the ranks and positions had become hereditary, much as they had on Earth. Possibly it was built deep in the psyche of human beings to follow a leader of royal blood when times became hard. Others in the crew weren't related to the original individuals. There existed a social system for testing the aptitude and apprenticing that guided people into whatever role best suited them. But that didn't hold true for the rank of captain, or as it had morphed, the role of the canatic. The canatic's job was to watch out for his or her people, to guard them and guide them. They had an almost mystic reverence for her, and I knew I had to proceed carefully. If I refused her, would it be a grand insult? Or was it possibly a trap of sorts? Was she seeking freedom from her role and yearning to do something wild? In that case, a fling with a starship captain from Earth might be viewed negatively by her people. I felt I could hardly ask the Canadic herself how the encounter she was proposing might affect our intersystem relations. She might take offense, which could blow the whole thing anyway. At last I decided to go with my heart. At our last meeting, Chloe and I hadn't been close. Before I'd left, she'd informed me it was over. Perhaps it was time to move on. As my face was still close to hers, I turned my head to where her lips were hot and close to my ear, and I kissed them lightly. This both shocked and pleased her. She almost shrieked with laughter and put her hand to her face. Her bodyguards shifted uncomfortably, as did Zai. We ignored them all. Back home on Earth, I'd grown up being scrutinized by agents with private agendas of their own. One had to learn to ignore them, or else having a personal life would be impossible. The Canadic made a sudden gesture. She pinwheeled one arm around, signaling the last guests and the bodyguards as well, apparently. They all rose and hurried out the door. The very last to go was Zai. She stood up slowly, shoulders slumped, and stalked toward the exit. Lady Grantholm stood in the opening, gesturing frantically for Zai to hurry. Zai didn't comply. Instead, she plodded out. Finally, the door closed with a resounding boom. Are we alone? I asked. At last. I've even demanded they turn off the cameras and stow the drones. My eyes searched the corners of the room in alarm. This set the canatic off into another fit of tinkling laughter. She became most unladylike after that. She vaulted upon me, and I allowed myself to be borne to the floor. There, on reed mats, lumpy pillows, and spilt drinks, we made love. It was desperate and hungry, at least on her part. I got the feeling she didn't allow herself to enjoy carnal pleasures often. You're a starship captain, she said when we'd separated and were lying side by side on the mats. I'm the great-granddaughter of the same it's only right we should indulge in intimacy together. I glanced at her. You don't do this sort of thing often, I gather? Almost never. The raiders ask, of course, but we have enough strength to deter them from risking the damage that forcing their will upon me would bring. Frowning, I rolled up onto one elbow. You mean these villains come here and ask to bed the Canatic as part of some kind of tribute? Yes. Didn't it once work that way on Earth? I recall stories of Helen of Troy and Cleopatra of Egypt. Hmm, I said thoughtfully. So you've only lain with the captains of starships? My people wouldn't allow anyone less for me.
Even then, when a friendly man comes along, they're often unsavory. I've only met two suitable companions before you in my thirty-two standard years. She'd reminded me that she wasn't younger than me, but older. Somehow her demeanor and relative innocence had left me thinking she was younger than I was. I corrected myself swiftly on the point of her innocence. The Canatic lived in a harsh galaxy. It might not be as full of Byzantine intrigue as was Old Earth, but it was full of pirates and conquerors. She began touching me then, lightly upon my bare chest, tugging at my chest hair. I gathered she hadn't seen such a thing before, and I also got the message she wasn't satisfied yet. We began a new round of lovemaking, but we never finished it. Suddenly a crashing sound interrupted our mood of pleasure. A hulking figure I knew too well had smashed her way into the room, bypassing the door entirely by breaking a window to gain entrance. Zai stooped in, ducking her head low. Her boots crunched on broken glass. A brilliant light splashed onto us. I've become wary over the years. Some might even say paranoid. My cloak and blade were never far from my reach these days. Leaping to my feet, I lifted my blade in one hand. My other arm was wrapped around the canatic's bare body. My cloak swirled around us both, and I switched it on. A series of gossamer planes of force enclosed the two of us. I'm sorry, Captain, Zai boomed. There's no time. We must return to Defiant. What's the hurry? I demanded between clenched teeth. Zai had always been jealous of any other female that I'd encountered. She'd taken on the role of my bodyguard, but sometimes she took that task too literally in my view. A squadron of raiders is approaching, she said, running her eyes over us. Nine ships in all. They're out of range but approaching fast. They're ignoring every call Duras sends to them. Lady Grantholm instructed me to locate you and escort you back to Defiant. By this time, the Canatic's protectors had opened the front door and rushed inside. They stood with lances glowing blue in the dimness. Is it true? the Canatic asked the leader of her guards. What the giant girl says? Are raiders approaching? The guard captain nodded. Yes, Canatic. A squadron of pirate ships has arrived. They're led by the raiding ship Blaze. Captain Lorne from Delamont has returned so soon? she asked. That bastard. He promised he'd hold off from visiting for three more years. Perhaps he left probes, Zai suggested. Perhaps he spies on you in secret, and when we arrived, he decided to drive us away. The Canatic nodded. She was slipping on her clothes. She ordered everyone out, and they obeyed, even Zai. I kissed the Canatic one last time, deeply. She and I shared smiles. We lingered, but said nothing. Both of us knew it was time to leave our interlude behind and get back to work. We were leaders of different peoples with different missions. Our private lives were minor details in the maelstrom of events. We parted, and I ran to the elevators. Zai followed me. I heard her heavy footsteps, but she didn't say a word. It took nearly half an hour to reach my ship, and in all that time I never stopped thinking about the Canatic's gentle touch. When I stepped back aboard the command deck and strapped myself into my chair, I finally felt at home. The urgency of the moment drove any melancholy thoughts from my mind. Welcome back, Captain, Duras said with relief. I looked at him, and it was clear he'd never left the command deck. His uniform was rumpled, and his hair was matted on one side. He'd probably slept in the command chair. I frowned, thinking that the man should learn to pace himself. He was too much of a worrier, perhaps, to ever captain a starship of his own. Sir, the pirate leader is hailing us, Yamada said. Put the call on screen, I ordered. The forward screen flared into life. I don't know what I'd expected, but what I saw wasn't it. Rather than a surly pirate of earthly lore with colorful dress, a hoary beard, and a toothless grin, I was met by an even more startling image. Captain Lorne was a stroge. That much was more than clear. His body was half machine and half human. The human pieces didn't match up, however. I could tell he'd taken trophies of flesh and plugged them haphazardly into his own mass. 
Exposed metal poked through his central biomass, gleaming like wet bone. Most prominent of these revealed structures were his shoulders. They were shaped steel joints with cables that whirred and snaked when he leaned forward to look us over. His arms looked fairly normal, but while the fingers of his right hand were pale flesh, those of his left hand were comprised of a webwork of steel rods. Each metal finger was as big around as a cigar. The only thing about Captain Lorne that reminded me of a traditional pirate was his eyes. One eye was a black camera that swiveled independently to scan my crew. The other was a lidless marble of wet, fleshy blue. This eye soon fixated upon me, and there it stayed, staring. Fifteen. Facing the Stroge again came as something of a shock for my crew. We'd battled them before in the defense of Earth, but we hadn't expected to encounter them so soon upon beginning to explore the colony worlds. Captain Sparhawk, the pirate said speaking first. I recognize you. You were highlighted in many reports after our failed mission to retake Earth. I'm afraid I don't recognize you, I said evenly. I'm glad you apparently have a human brain, however. Is that meant as an insult? Captain Lorne demanded, shifting uncomfortably in his chair. His shoulders whirred and clicked as he moved. My mind works as well as the full electrics, I'll have you know. No insult was intended, sir. I was merely noting that your manner of speech is more natural and fluid than your counterparts with artificial neurology. What of it? snorted the pirate. I think it might be easier to deal with a being whose brain is at least made of flesh. I've dealt with a number of your kind, and I found those with biological minds are more neurotypical. Lorne stared at me thoughtfully. I could tell he was surprised at my reactions. Rather than displaying fear and dismay, I was exhibiting personal knowledge of his people. I wanted him to know I could deal with and defeat his kind if necessary. In truth, my guts were roiling inside, but I hid all that and projected the utmost confidence. Hmm, Lorne said after a pause. It's as the Nexus calculated. You're an existential danger to our plans. You must be countered, and if at all possible, excised. I'll make you a bargain, Captain. I'm always willing to listen to diplomatic offers. At that moment, there was a ruckus behind me. Someone pushed past security and rushed to grip the command deck railing. Lady Granthorne pointed a long finger at the screen. Her finger was shaking and slightly crooked. Agent Sparhawk, how many ways will you seek to engage in diplomacy without my input? She raged. This can only be a plot. I wheeled my chair to face her quizzically. A plot? Yes, you left me back on that station without consideration. I had to beg the Canatic for transport back to Defiant. Didn't you notice I wasn't there on the pinnace with you while you flew to the ship? She had me there. I had forgotten about her. The confrontation with Zai, the arrival of this pirate squadron, and most of all my bittersweet dalliance with the Canatic, had driven all thoughts of my aunt from my mind. It wouldn't do to admit this, however. I'm sorry, madam, I said. My first duty is always to my ship. I rushed here to take up my battle station. She stalked around the central deck, moving hand over hand along the railing. That's just it, she said. You rush to battle, but no battle need occur. I'm here to perform my duty, to create peace where you would only deliver strife and destruction. My eyes turned back toward the pirate, who was still there, quietly leering at us from the forward screen. I could see he was following the conflict with intense interest. He wasn't even saying anything, just listening. Captain Lorne, Grantholm said, turning to the Stroge at last. I'm Ambassador Grantholm, and I'm empowered to negotiate on Earth's behalf. I must apologize profusely for any problems Sparhawk may have caused. I would like to offer— Apologies aren't good enough, Lorne spat out. You must concede your claims here. Leave this system never to return. My aunt seemed flustered. That's an extreme position, she said. We can negotiate. No, we can't. Not until certain basic conditions are met. I don't understand your hostile attitude, Captain. Then let me spell it out for you, Ambassador Grantholm. Your fleets drove my people from the solar system unfairly. 
It's our home just as much as it is yours. The system is large, and we could have been accepted as co-owners, but instead we were attacked and exiled. The ambassador gave me a plaintive look, but I shrugged. I planned to sit back and watch her diplomatic skills in all their glory. You started off by infiltrating and attacking us, she said, returning her gaze to Lorne. We responded in an act of self-defense. Nevertheless, Lorne said, you are seen as the aggressor by the Stroge. You must therefore make concessions to regain our trust. Are you willing to entertain our proposals? My aunt licked her lips. She was rarely nervous, but the stakes were high today. She'd suddenly been thrust into a position that may trigger a fresh restart to a war everyone on Earth had hoped was over. Earth doesn't intend to invade this system, she said. We won't occupy it or attempt to drive the strode from it. Perhaps we should consider this to be neutral territory, where both sides can trade with the G people as a go-between. It could be a first step toward normalizing relations. Normalizing relations? Lorne asked incredulously. For my people, normal relations are those manifest between any slave and their master. The only matter of importance is which of the two roles each side takes. No, if you want peace, you must flee right now. Grantholm sucked in a deep breath, and then she gritted her teeth. All right, she said. We'll withdraw to Earth. Give my best to your leader and hold on said the pirate, leaning forward with predatory excitement. I require a tribute as well, a trophy. Grantholm frowned. What kind of trophy? It would award me high status if I was able to consume Earth's ambassador, Lorne mused. But I don't relish adding weathered flesh such as yours to my person. Instead, I want Sparhawk. There's no more hated name among the Stroge. Grantholm began to sputter. Zai stood up angrily. I had to admit I was alarmed as well, but Lorne wasn't done with his list of demands yet. Further, he said, I'll take the Conatic. I've brought many ships this time. Her fighters can't prevail. The Conatic? I demanded. You go too far even to suggest it. Lorne looked back to me again. I thought you were outranked, Sparhawk. Be silent and listen to your mistress. She has no authority to order me to my death. The same can be said of the Canatic. Ah, suddenly I understand, the pirate said. Of course, you favor the woman who commands this battered station. Yes, I watch the vids she broadcasts to every citizen of this system. It's well known the Canatic recently mated with you, Sparhawk, but I would urge you to overcome your protective emotions. Let's get back to the point, Grantholm interrupted. Complete your list of demands for peace, Captain Lorne. Very well. I want them both. I want their flesh to merge with mine and adorn my body. There are spots on my person that are in need of replacement. They're beginning to leak and grow fetid. These new infamous shreds of meat will be grafted into those locations. I'll return to the High Court with a pair of trophies worthy of displaying to anyone. No one knew quite what to say. That is, no one other than myself. Zai, I said, please escort Ambassador Grantholm to her cabin. Her work here is done. Grantholm was grabbed rudely. She squawked and clutched at my chair as she was marched away. I turned to watch her removal. This is a diplomatic crisis, she insisted. I'm still in command of this mission. I would agree that we're in a crisis, I said but the matter has been removed from your hands. This pirate has physically threatened both myself and the Conatic. You should recall that you entered into a mutual defense treaty with her only yesterday. You'll not get away with standing on that thin tread, she complained. Zai applied fractionally more pressure to the elderly woman, and she was driven from the deck. Spinning myself back around, I found the pirate had manufactured a sad face. A pity, he said. You're likely to be destroyed before I can overcome your ship. I really wanted to merge with you, Sparhawk. There's no greater prize in the galaxy. My apologies, Lorne, I said, but this discussion is at an end. You've chosen the path of war. 
The record will clearly show that for all time. The hunched creature grinned. We shall see if you're as good as they say you are, Sparhawk. The screen went dark, and the star field returned. They're accelerating, Captain, Yamada said almost immediately. The raider squadron has shifted into a wedge formation. Sound battle stations? Are the engines ready for battle speed? Yes, sir. Then let's move out. Put some distance between us and the station. We'll try to get the Strodes to move between us so we can put them into a crossfire. The ship began to lurch and heave under us. The power of Defiant was awe-inspiring at times like these. She was greater than she had been when she'd been commissioned by the Betas long ago. The best Earth technology had been applied to improve her. The resulting amalgam of tech from several worlds had created a ship that was unique in its capabilities. The enemy quickly responded to my maneuvers. They changed course, shifting into an arc that would place my ship in range while staying outside the range of the station. My estimation of Captain Lorne's capacities rose. Captain, Duras said, I think we should move around behind the station, let it serve as a buffer between us and the enemy ships. I looked at him, then slid my eyes back to the tactical screens. The Kanatic had deployed her fighters in three groups, as she had before. They were wisely hugging up close to the station, no doubt watching the drama that was unfolding outside her walls. How quickly we consider throwing our new allies into peril when a serious enemy arrives on the scene, I commented. Duras moved closer to my command chair and lowered his voice. Sir, I urge you not to let your personal feelings interfere with the decisions you must make regarding the survival of this ship. Becoming annoyed, I stood up and walked to the tactical planning tables in the back of the command deck. He followed me. First Officer Duras, I said. Have I done anything to suggest my judgment is compromised? No, sir. Good. Now, please save such fears for a moment when I've earned them. Yes, sir, he said, hanging his head. I was in the wrong. Sorry, sir. The situation is intense. Exactly. That's when I need you on the top of your game. Now, let's figure out how best to destroy this force. Over the next few minutes, I contacted the Gnatic and requested support from her fighters, but she refused. She explained regretfully they were her only defense, and she needed every one of them to protect her station. I couldn't argue in good conscience. I wasn't surprised by her reaction in any case. The station was at a disadvantage in this scenario. That was generally the case with any fortification. The ships on both sides could move freely, while she was stuck in place. She couldn't take the initiative. She could only react. We worked together on the tactical boards for twenty minutes, gaming out various strategies with the help of the planning computers. The situation was grim. We outrange them and outgun them ship for ship, I said, but there's no denying the fact they outnumber us. No matter how we set up the battle, the computer predicted defeat. Each time the pirates pulled us down like a bear encircled by a pack of wolves, we could take out several, but we could never take them all. There's only one solution, sir, Duras said. We must flee. I considered it, then rejected the idea. There are factors at work here aside from the calculations. One of them is moral. These Strode are humans, at least partly. If we can break their will, they'll run. Striding back to the command chair, a deflated Commander Duras followed me. Helm, swing about, I ordered. Take us closer to the Stroge forces until we reach maximum range. I want to snipe at them while retreating with our superior speed. The ship made a gut-wrenching turn that lasted ten minutes or so. We'd built up enough velocity to transform a course change into a long, drawn-out affair. The maneuver ended with us making a sunward pass, crossing the path of the pirate ships at an angle. Maximum effective range attained, Zai reported from the weapons board. Commence firing! Go easy, give the chambers plenty of time to cool between salvos. We might not hit much anyway. She doubled up the timing on the cooling cycle, and the big guns began to release gouts of energy in the direction of the enemy. We were about two million kilometers out. At that range, the beams wouldn't hit with the same focused power they could muster when close. Still, it would make a good test case. I had no idea how armored the enemy was, or what kind of countermeasures they might possess. The pirates sensed our fire when it struck one of the outside ships of the formation. 
They began weaving in a random pattern after that. Damage? I asked Yamada, who was studying her sensor data closely. Not much. We have some dust and debris, mostly metallic, but the ship seems to be operating with no degradation of efficiency. It's difficult to measure damage precisely from this distance, sir. I nodded and began to pace the deck, looking over people's shoulders. The whoosh and singing sound of our main guns kept going every minute or so as our batteries fired in a slow, rhythmic fashion. The sounds made by the big guns were impressive. Defiant's primary armament consisted of three banks of heavy particle cannons. They'd been upgraded over the preceding year. We'd improved both the fire control system and the punch the weapons could deliver. As a result, they created more heat, noise, and even some recoil when fired. In addition to firepower, we'd upgraded their operating options. I could now override safety systems and direct them to fire individually or in unison. The original beta-designed fire control module had been simple, and like the betas themselves, more rigid in performance. Duris waved me to his side, and I joined him at his planning tables. Captain, the enemy is releasing obscuring air gels. A predictable countermeasure? What about incoming fire? Nothing yet. I'd predict we're at twice their effective range still. Doesn't do any good if we can't take them out. We've got them ducking, but they're still closing and not taking any— Sir, we've got another hit, chimed in Yamada. Same ship, but now she's leaking gas. I rushed to her side. Duris was right behind me. That's gas, all right, he said. She's got a hull breach. That's excellent shooting, Zai, I said. She flashed me a tiny smile. Then the enemy ship blew up. We sucked in our breaths. That changes everything, Duris said, moving back to his tactical planning boards. Either we got lucky, or the enemy ships are more lightly armored than I'd assumed. Update your battle predictions. Uh, we'll take most of them now before we're destroyed. Six at least, maybe as many as eight. I frowned. I'd hoped for victory. What's the turning point? He shrugged. The moment they get within effective range, we can keep firing, getting closer every minute, blowing them down. If we can take them at this rate, and a little faster, we'll get maybe three more. But then they'll be able to hit us in return. They'll outgun us and destroy us. I knew math didn't lie, but I also knew that tactics could drastically change the math. Everyone get to their seats and harness up, I ordered. After a fraction of a second, they were all rushing to obey me. Sound emergency maneuvers. Get everyone into a seat in thirty seconds. All over the ship, klaxons sounded and lights spun. The crew buzzed in my ear as decks reported in. Some wanted to know what was going on. Others were confirming that they'd complied. I gave them their thirty seconds, then another ten. Finally, I figured they'd had all the time I could spare. Zai, I said, turning to her. If we black out, take over. Will do, Captain. To the helmsman, I said, Helm, hard about. Take us away from these pirates. Dive away from the plane of the elliptic and don't look back. We're bugging out of this fight. After that, the engines began to thrum, then roar, then scream. The ship shook and the lights dimmed. Or was that my vision going? We plunged through space, using what was perhaps the greatest asset Defiant possessed. Sheer speed. 16. We'd left the pirates with a difficult decision. They could continue to chase us, or they could turn away and bore in on the station. They chose as I hoped they would. They're going directly for the station, sir, Yamada said. All engines stop, I ordered. Begin braking, gently. We're turning around again. A few of the command staffers exchanged glances and shrugs. Maybe they thought their captain was crazy, but I didn't care. Duris stood next to me, nodding. Hit and run, sir. What else can we do? We can't plow into them and die. If we keep harassing them, picking them off. Sir, Yamada said. The Kanatic is calling. I glanced at her in surprise. I'll take it privately. Stepping into my private conference room, I activated a much smaller screen. A distraught young woman faced me. I can't say that I blame you. But your retreat from battle has left us worse off than before, Captain Sparhawk. How so? 
Normally these pirates would only demand tribute. Now, after the wanton destruction of one of their vessels, they'll demand blood, literally. Rather than allow my entire people to suffer, I've opted to allow Captain Lorne to meld with my flesh and take what he will. I don't... Hold on, Kinetic, I said. I'm not running. I'm maneuvering. She cocked her head and stared at me. We're watching closely. You're slowing down. Why would you behave in this fashion? It's called tactics. The enemy will shortly be between us. Please, use your weapons. Make the best of this difficult situation. She thought about it, then shook her head. I cannot do that as much as I'd like to. The Stroge are angry. They'll have to be appeased. I stood up, becoming angry myself. If you won't stand up for your own defense, you can hardly blame us for our tactics. Her eyes stayed downcast. I'm sorry, she said. Think of me in your final moments. I promise to do the same. The channel closed before I could come up with a suitable response. I slammed my fist on the desk, then stood and straightened my uniform. I walked out of the room with a forced smile. Any news, sir? Durris asked. Yes, I suspect they'll help when they see we're winning. I'm sure no one expected anything else, did they? Their faces fell. My crew had been hoping the Canatic would cast her lot in with us immediately. That wasn't to be, but I tried to put the best possible spin on it. Are we closing again? I asked. Yes, sir, but at a slow rate. We're behind them now. Open fire, concentrating on the hindmost target as soon as we're within effective range. The wait that followed was interminable. Space was a grim place in which to do battle. You could often detect your enemy, but you couldn't always do anything to him. Instead, one was forced to watch them maneuver and destroy things at great distances with nearly perfect visual and instrumental acuity. It was maddening. The pirate ships were within range of the station's guns, but they didn't fire. Their fighters hid behind the station as well, like children gripping their mother's skirts. Finally, we reached effective range. Our biggest guns spoke, and after several minutes, the hindmost ship of their formation was blown to atoms. There's a message incoming from the pirate leader, sir, Yamada said. Smiling, I waved to her. Put it on screen. A mask of feral rage appeared. It was Lorne, and he'd clearly had better days. You're a jackal, Sparhawk, he said. They didn't tell me that. You nip at my buttocks and run crying when I wheel upon you. Perhaps they didn't school you on basic tactics, Lorne, I said comfortably. You move me to take drastic action, he growled. I'm giving you one more chance to comply with my wishes before I do something we'll both regret. Frowning, I spoke as if barely interested. Drastic action, like what? I'll have to destroy the station. Millions will die. This did concern me, and I'd been worried he might try it. Fortunately, I had already decided how I was going to deal with this threat. It's about time, I said, shrugging. Get on with it, by all means. We'll gladly destroy your ships one at a time while you waste your firepower on civilians. My threat doesn't end there, he said. I must end you as well. He said this last with remorse. I'd hoped you would see reason. I'd hoped you would allow me to feast upon you. But no, I can see now you're too stubborn and short-sighted for that. The channel closed. My brow furrowed in irritation. Two people in a row had seen fit to end my conversations with them rudely. That was my last thought, unfortunately, before disaster struck. I had an inkling of what was to come, but not enough of one. Captain! shouted Yamada suddenly. There's something wrong in the engine room. The heat levels. I'm getting a radiation spike. Get my engineer on the line. O'Donnell had been replaced by a junior officer. I'd liked the new man the moment I met him, but it was possible that he was incompetent. There was no particular strain on the engines at this moment, no obvious reason why they should fail us now. I'm trying, sir, Yamada said. No one in engineering is responding. As I digested that statement, Zai wheeled around and reached toward me with a long, thick arm. She caught my spinning seat and forcibly spun me to face her. Sir, they're dead. Who's dead? The engineering crew. All of them. 
The core has been breached. Radiation and heat are flooding the ship. Captain, we're on fire. Automated systems began going off, sounding the alarm. Damage control reported in. Their teams were on the way, but they couldn't even get to the engine room. Rumbold was acting chief of the damage crew when he wasn't running the helm. As he wasn't on the command deck now, I contacted him personally to see what was going on. It's awful, Captain, he cried. We've got burned bodies, and the air is sparkling. We can't even get close to engineering. Worse, it's spreading every minute. Sir, we might have to abandon ship. Stunned, I looked around me. Every crewman on the deck was in full panic mode. Could this truly be the end? And how had that pirate managed to reach out across a million kilometers and cripple my ship anyway? The moment I posed the question, I already knew the answer. O'Donnell and her crew of Stroge engineers had done more than blow apart a compartment and abandon ship. They'd left something else behind. We'd searched. We'd done everything we could to find it, but we'd missed it. Now the entire ship was in danger. Sir, Yamada said, we're losing power. We're cruising, but we're no longer capable of acceleration or making significant course changes. The main engines are dead. We're down to our steering jets. She looked at me. I could tell she was frightened, but she maintained a professional attitude. What are the enemy doing, Duris? I called. My first officer looked worse for the wear. He was bent over the charting table, battling the planning computer. They've reversed course, he said. They're not going after the station any longer. I nodded, unsurprised. How long until Lorn reaches us? Six hours, sir, maybe less. I can only go by the speed they've mustered so far with their engines. They may have been holding back in previous engagements, but I doubt it. So, Captain Lorne will have his revenge in six hours. Time to earn our pay. Bring Defiant about and target Blaze, Lorne's flagship. Duris shook his head. That's not normal Starguard policy, sir. If you kill the one man you have contact with, you don't have anyone to negotiate terms with when the battle comes to a conclusion. I let out a bitter laugh. I didn't mean to, but I wasn't in the best mood right now. Lorn won't accept our surrender, and he won't offer his own. But if we can knock him out, the rest of his ships may suffer from the resulting confusion. Lock onto his ship and wait for him to come into effective range. It would be several hours until the firing began again, so I got up and headed below decks. It was time for me to examine the damage personally and determine what, if anything, we could do about it. From the start, the damage control people were less than encouraging. You can see the leak from here, sir, Rumbold said, standing next to me in a corridor that was full of flashing blue sparkles. We wore radiation suits, but no one thought the protection could be 100% effective. The leak was too significant. Flush the atmosphere on this deck out into space, I ordered. That's a lot of air we won't get back any time soon, Rumbold cautioned. I looked down at him. Sometimes my crewmen were short-sighted. If we can't get past this leak, we aren't going to be needing an air supply. Still, he hesitated. Sir, if anyone's alive in there, needing help, flush the atmosphere now, I said in a hard voice. The odds were no one was alive, and even if they were, they couldn't be in good shape. Asphyxiating them now would be a mercy. Without another word, he activated the hatches and pumps. In that moment, all hope of rescuing injured engineering people vanished. The hard vacuum outside the ship effectively sucked all the air off the deck and much of the radiation with it. The leak was still active, but without an easy gas medium to drift around on, the dust particles weren't as much of a problem. We advanced to where the cooling jacket had ruptured. A shower of bluish steam still vented from the spot, but it froze into a crystalline mass almost as fast as it came out of the hole. The cold vacuum is working to contain the leak, at least temporarily, Rumbold commented. That was probably a good call, sir. Let's go, I said, wading through the shower of frosty particles and into the engine room beyond. He looked startled, but he followed me quickly enough. A wary team in yellow hazmat suits followed us. Every one of them winced when they got near the frozen fountain of radioactive coolant, and I couldn't blame them for that. We'd all be eating potassium iodide tablets by the handful tonight, 
unless we died sooner. When we reached the engine room, we discovered a ghastly mess. Seven crew members had perished. They'd been burned and then frozen stiff when I'd opened the hatches. A few of them might have been alive. It was hard to tell. Their bulging eyes and bloody, frothing lips might have indicated death from any number of causes. We pressed past the drifting dead and examined the engine core. This was the key to our survival, to the survival of Defiant herself. It didn't look good. The engines had suffered a serious blast. Something had been placed under the core, possibly an explosive device, and it had gone off when Captain Lorne had commanded it to. The device can't have been very large, Rumbled commented, climbing underneath the cowling and grunting while he worked. But it didn't have to be. It was placed with expert care. We didn't find it due to the shielding all around here. Sir, I think this thing was planted very deliberately by experts. No kidding, I said. A parting gift by O'Donnell and her crew, no doubt. The question is, can you fix it? Fix it? Maybe. Given half a year's time and a well-equipped dry dock, this engine is dead, sir. I heaved a sigh. The enemy had taken out Earth's first starship without hitting us with a single salvo. Do what you can. I need some kind of power. Anything. Even just give me enough to maneuver. I might be able to do that, Rumbled muttered. He was already at work. Only his feet stuck out from beneath the cowling. His nervous damage control crew filed in and began following his barking commands. I left the engine room with a heavy heart and headed back up to the command deck. We had less than five hours before the enemy caught and destroyed us. 17. The enemy's ships came into range three hours later. They'd adopted by that time what we considered to be unorthodox tactics. They formed a column, sir, Durris said. A column? Yes, they've lined up the ships. Only one of them is visible from our point of view. I rubbed my chin briefly. I see. They now know that we have superior range and they've adapted. With only one ship in front of all the others, they hope to reduce the odds of our striking them. Exactly. Oh, and, sir, the lead ship is not Captain Lorne's. Chuckling, I found myself unsurprised. There was some humanity left in that stroge, after all. He wasn't interested in dying. He was going to let someone else do it for him. I had to wonder if he was in the very last ship in the line. All right, I said. Hold your fire. I assume they're still dodging from side to side in a random pattern? Yes, in perfect synchronicity. Right. Try to figure out their pattern and plot it, Duris. He frowned. Sir, I just said the pattern was random. I lifted a finger in his direction. But it isn't. It can't be, really. They aren't coordinating with transmissions between the ships, are they? No. Well, then, they must be running a program that generates a seemingly random course adjustment after a predetermined length of time. That way, they're all able to stay in a perfect line. Hmm, he said, studying the data. After a few minutes, he returned with fresh hope in his eyes. I think you're right, sir. They're shifting course about every eleven seconds. This is very consistent, and it matches your theory. They're all following a pattern. Exactly. Break the code, Duris. When you do, we'll strike. We stayed almost motionless for the following ninety-one minutes. By that time, even I was doubting the rationality of my plan. I stood up and joined Duris at the planning table. Sweat dripped from his brow, despite the fact the command deck was heavily air-conditioned. We're in optimal range now. I said. The enemy must think we're dead in space. No powers, no weapons, nothing. Yes, sir, I know, sir. And while that does offer some strategic advantages, I continued. I was hoping... I'm sorry, sir. There are three possibilities, and I just can't narrow it down from there. I blinked. Only three? Yes, sir. I've been stuck on this for the last half hour. I just can't... My hand came up to rest heavily on his shoulder. Give me your three solutions. I'll deal with it from here. He complied, and I pondered them. I chose one at random, and ordered Zai to unload all our cannons at once. We'd fire a full burn barrage on one of the three possible positions the enemy might shift to. Zai frowned at me. The usual tactic is to spread out your fire so that we only have eleven seconds, Zai, I said. Follow my orders or I'll find someone who will. 
Without another word, she engaged the algorithm. The cannons went live, and after the next shift, they fired all at once. The ship's response was remarkable. The deck shivered and the lights dimmed. We were at our power limits, even with our engines dead and disengaged. A tremendous gush of power traveled downrange at the speed of light. We were still several light seconds distant from the enemy, so we didn't know instantly if we'd guessed right. Cycle the batteries, I said. Fire them all again on the second solution in seven. Six. Sir, the cooling cycle hasn't completed yet. I'm well aware of that. Three. Two. One. Fire! The cannons unleashed their fury again. Retarget on the third, I began. Sir, Zai called out. We've got a flame out on seven, twelve, and nineteen, taking them offline until... Fire again on my mark! Seven. Six. Hold it! Yamada shouted. We've got a hit! Confirmed? I demanded. Yes, sir. On screen, at extreme visual range. The forward screen lit up and it was the most beautiful sight I'd seen so far today. A blossom of blue-white gas flared into existence. As soon as it faded, a second expanded into view behind it. I began to grin. My plan had worked. Stand down the cannons. Send work crews to the roof to work on the failed units. Tell them to be prepared to duck in case we need to fire again. Crews dispatched. Wheeling around to Yamada, I leaned forward anxiously. How many did we get? It's hard to interpret, given the enemy's placement, she said, staring into her instrumentation. I think we burned through the first ship right into the second and probably a third all at once. She looked up at me. That was your plan, wasn't it, sir? That's why you let them get close, so they'd be lined up for a single hard blow that would knock them all out at once? I shrugged. They adapted, so I did the same. Genius, she muttered turning back to her instruments. It was Durris, however, who made the determination on how we'd scored. Three ships destroyed, sir, and a fourth badly damaged. They've broken up their formation, and they're all widely dispersed now, weaving new and differing patterns. I nodded, satisfied, but not finished. Target the damaged ship. I assume it's not moving with the same alacrity as the others? He glanced at me. No, sir, but I looked at him. Has the damaged ship turned away? No, they're continuing to close. First Officer Durris, I said. I've fought the Stroge before. They're not easily dissuaded. In fact, in my experience, they have to suffer very heavy losses before they break off an attack. Fire on my mark! Durris turned away without a word. The cannons hummed, then buzzed, then sang. Another ship was destroyed, unable to shift away fast enough. We'd made a good accounting of ourselves. Captain, Lorn is hailing us. I looked at Yamada in surprise. I hadn't expected this. Parley in the midst of a heated battle? Could it be a ruse? Open the channel, but keep up a random spread of predictive attacks. Maybe we can catch another of their ships before they get in close enough to shoot back. While the cannons buzzed and sang periodically overhead, the forward screen lit up again. Sparhawk, you devil, the pirate said. He glared at me with a hate that was palpable. Captain, I said, this is a surprise. Do you wish to discuss terms? Yes, he said. I have new demands. I'll accept only your person as a trophy. In turn, I'll let your ship escape, and I'll leave the station alone. Your beloved Kanatic will live on, as will all her people. What do you say? What changed your mind? I asked, curiously. He snarled at me. We both knew my smashing blow to the enemy's smout had changed everything. He no longer had the clear upper hand. Do you accept my terms or not? he demanded. I hesitated for a few seconds. It was a tempting offer in some ways. One life in trade for millions? Did I value my own skin so highly? The trouble was, of course, I couldn't trust the Stroge to keep their word. Even if they did, they'd probably come back next year and do it all again. I have different terms in mind, I said. Destroy your weapons, abandon your ships, and set them adrift. If you do that, I'll stop firing. We'll pick you up, and I promise every stroge who's still breathing now will continue to do so. That's your final word on the topic, he marveled. It is. Truly, I expected no less from you. 
We'll make fine roommates in hell, you and I, Sparhawk. The channel closed. Continue firing, I said. But, sir, they're breaking off. I blinked at Yamada in surprise. Hold fire, then, I said. Then I turned toward Duris and his planning table. I joined him at his boards. What's going on? I demanded. They're turning to a new course, fleeing. This must be the reason. Tiny new contacts were on the boards now. They were distant, but closing. Are those missiles? Duris smiled. No, sir. They're fighters. The Kanatic has finally committed herself. I smiled back. I knew she would, I said. But in truth, I'd known no such thing. It was technically a lie, but I'd meant it to be morale-building, so it didn't trouble me much. Sir, Duris said a few minutes later, I figured out where the enemy is going. There's another ER bridge out there. They're heading for it. Studying the data, I came to the same conclusion. It left me in a quandary. Should I let them go? Or should I blast them until their last ship was destroyed? 18. In the end, I let the Stroge ships escape. It was probably a misguided act of mercy, but when an enemy is defeated and fleeing, any Star Guard officer would have trouble killing them as they ran. After all, the Stroge had been human once. They'd warped away from basics such as myself, their term for Earthmen, but perhaps they could be taught the concept of honor once again through example. It was a faint hope, but one that I refused to give up on. The Canatics fighters never caught the enemy's ships as they fled, but they did return eventually to tow us back to their friendly port. Our second visit to Tranquility Station was much more pleasant and cordial than the first had been. The G people welcomed all my crewmen this time with open arms. We were more than their allies now. We were their saviors. The station's mechanics became wholly focused on repairing Defiant's significant damage. Ambassador Grantholm quickly took to showing exaggerated interest in anything to do with G fashion, culture, or cuisine. There is no doubt that boasting of her familiarity of alien subtleties would cause her to be the envy of all the great houses of Earth. The Canatic was particularly accommodating. She and I shared each other's company nightly. This fact never failed to put Zai into a bad mood, but I overcame her sullen glares. After a month, our vessel was ready to fly again. During that time, the G people had impressed upon us one single fact. The Strode were not done with this system. They would return to seek vengeance at some point. This didn't concern me too much, as they'd sworn vengeance upon Earth as well. Perhaps if I kept beating them in battle, they'd have a long list of systems they wished to destroy, and the inhabitants would band together to bring them down once and for all. When our engines were fully operational again, I called a conference aboard Defiant. My top commanders gathered, and we discussed our next move. Ambassador Grantholm barged in when we were in a heated debate. Duras and Yamada wanted to press ahead and explore more systems, while I wanted to head home and share what we'd learned with Earth. All of us looked up at the ambassador in surprise as she entered. Her brows were knit together, forming a potent glare as she swept the group with her eyes. So, you three again, she said. Does a day go by during which you don't seek to undermine my authority? I'm not sure what you're talking about, Ambassador, I said. Of course not. You've already forgotten the division of authority on this ship. Is that it? I'm in charge when we aren't in battle. This mission is mine to command when there's no danger. I'm asserting that authority now. She stepped in and sat down across the table from me. Her aged fingers folded together in a wrinkled lattice, and she stared at me over the top of them. Very well, I said. We were just discussing our next destination. I wish to return to Earth, as we now have a great deal of data. We can transmit that data the moment we enter the solar system, inquiring then where they think we should explore next. Grantholm chewed that over. It was a sound proposal. Surely even she could see that. No, she said at last. We'll press on. We'll follow the Stroge. You should have destroyed those ships when you had the chance. Is that what this is about? A difference in tactics? Not at all. I simply wish to see where they went before they get away completely. I can tell you that, said Zai. We all looked past the ambassador. Zai had appeared in the doorway behind the older woman. I frowned at this development. 
Zai often managed to horn her way into these events. She didn't seem to care if she'd been invited or not. Zai, why are you here? Granthom asked pointedly. She shrugged. I know more about the Stroge than any of you. Will you not allow my input? Heaving a sigh, Ambassador Granthom waved for her to enter and be seated. That was another thing that irked me. Grantholm 